when you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in the Fed's case, all it has are interest rate monetary policy and the ability to buy assets directly from banks. That's it. It has its interest rates and it has balance sheet. And right now, um, its rates are no longer working. It really front loaded its hiking cycle because it knew the moment that this credit contraction started occurring and this flight to safety started occurring in treasuries, it wouldn't be able to transmit policy effectively anymore. And now we're seeing the outcome of that. The Fed has been trying to induce a slowdown in credit expand or uh, in new credit because that's the only way it can control inflation. All it has are these interest rates. And so we are starting to see that now. The Fed tightened aggressively out of necessity. And now the downturn that comes on the other end of it will be just as severe and just as aggressive. And we are just seeing the beginning parts of that now, right? Bank failures um, wasn't necessarily expected. But with those bank failures, obviously, the process of banks extending less credit to consumers, uh, businesses, and property developers, that is accelerating. And then obviously, you will be able to see that uh, in home prices. You'll be able to see that in uh, in the labor market. Um, and you'll be able to see that in business activity, business sentiment. Um, and that's being all, all of these things are sort of occurring all at once to some degree. My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is Always Be Building. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. Hope you enjoy the show. Joe. Welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely, Max. Thanks for having me. Love following the macro stuff. I've been following you on Twitter for a little while now, working with you guys some on the Bitcoin layer stuff, getting on talking on the energy side, but follow a lot of what you do on the macro stuff. It's just you're putting out a ton of great content. Real quick, for those that don't know you, they're listening to the podcast, just a background on on yourself and, uh, and what you're working on. Yeah, for sure. So my name is Joe. I am a markets analyst over at the Bitcoin Layer, which is an independent research publication. Um, I write it with myself and Nick Batia, um, a professor over at the University of Southern California and author of Layered Money. And we basically cover Bitcoin through a global macro lens. And these days, uh, macro is especially in the driver's seat now that we're um, sort of approaching this uh, this really big economic downturn. Uh, basically, you know, macro. Uh, is is extremely interesting. It's heating up to a very large degree, and so basically, I um you know I, I tweet very very often, but for the most part, um, I'm analyzing markets, I'm charting, I'm striking levels, and then using that information, I'm uh, I'm writing Substack posts to keep readers informed about all the latest happenings in markets, and I'm doing YouTube videos that do the same. The content's great, man. The YouTube videos are awesome. The Morning Cup of Joe is one of my favorites. I love just the quick, digestible content, and then the longer form stuff that you guys do with the newsletter. I usually ask this at the end, but I'll ask it at the beginning because it's probably better. Where's the best place to consume uh, your content? Yeah, absolutely. So on screen, the at Joe Consorti that you can see, uh, you could just give me a give me a follow on Twitter if you'd like. That's the best place to find uh, you know all of my uh, market musings in the moment. That was an alliteration I didn't intend to happen. And then uh, also um, the BitcoinLayer.com. Sweet. All right. Starting out, let's just talk about the bond market. I know that's where you guys like to focus a lot and what rates are doing. But before we talk about today and what you're seeing, uh, maybe give just kind of a brief history of the last year, or really since the Fed started tightening, what you guys were paying attention to, what was interesting, kind of track us where it's been since this new, uh, since inflation picked up and the Fed started acting, uh, to, and then we'll get to today and what you're paying attention to. Yeah, absolutely. So that's an awesome jumping off point. Basically, for the entire last, uh, we'll call it year and a half, right, since um, October 2021, per se, uh, inflation really began uh, being a problem in the middle of 2021. And then beginning in October of 2021, um, the bond market started moving. Um, and the front end started moving first. Now, each tenor along the US Treasury curve um, tells us something, right? Every single Uh, period in time that you can invest in, each instrument tells us a little bit about investor behavior based on the price action. Um, Within bonds, for those of you who are unaware, as the price of a bond moves up, its yield moves down. And so we monitor uh, the yield uh, along the US Treasury curve to give us some signal about what investors are anticipating is going to happen. Um, The front end of the curve, specifically the two-year yield, that is a good proxy for um, the policy rate, right? What does the market think the policy rate is going to be uh, two years from now? And in October of 2021, um, it started moving up 
pretty considerably, right? It started it started moving up um, as the two year note sold off. Uh, and that was basically saying the bond market saying, hey, we anticipate the Fed is going to raise interest rates. Lo and behold, five months later, March of 2022, the Fed hikes for the first time. They hiked by, uh, I believe it was 50 basis points. So they hiked once um, by 50 basis points, and then they hiked uh, two more times by 50 basis points, right? These are already large increments by which the Fed can raise its policy interest rates. Um, now, that I say policy interest rates because the Fed doesn't actually raise interest rates per se. When people think about the Federal Reserve, they think that, um, you know, it's this, it's this governing body that actually sets uh, interest rates, it actually tries to influence interest rates on uh, the way that it does that. It, it has various tools that we don't necessarily need to get into, um, but its main tool that it uses is its suite of policy rates. And the main one that gets referenced is Fed funds. And so the bond market was basically predicting that the Fed would raise rates and it did. Um, and, and we have an expression of the Bitcoin layer that rates lead the Fed. Rates move out ahead of what the Fed is going to do. And so we use the two-year yield as sort of our guide for behavior that the Federal Reserve is going to take. And all throughout 2022, it was the exact same story. Um, twos were ripping into the stratosphere. They reached as high as uh, you know five and a half percent at points, um, basically predicting that the Fed would would reach um, you know a five and a half percent terminal rate. Um, but as of recently, uh, with the Fed's aggressive hiking, they have obviously downsized, downshifted the pace of their hikes. Um, and with that, you've also seen the two-year yield, which, as I said, is a proxy for the, the Fed's policy rate. It's fallen down below uh, the policy rate, right? So twos has actually inverted the federal funds rate by a full percentage point now, right? So the federal funds rate right now is 4.8. 4 That's the effective rate. The upper bound is 5%. And um, the two-year treasury yield uh, is is much, much, much lower than that, Um I, uh, I have it in front of me. It's 385. And actually today it's it's closer to 360. So 3.6%. Uh, it's 1.2 if you're going by effective or 1.4% below where the Fed wants to influence policy. Um, now I mentioned the Fed doesn't set interest rates. It tries to influence them with a set of tools. So if the interest rates that you are trying to influence are lower than the level you're trying to set them at by a full 1.4%, your tools no longer work, right? Your tools... Um, the, it, more, more interest rate hikes are futile because you can't actually effectively influence front end rates up any longer. And effectively what the rates market is saying here is that it expects the Fed to not only stop hiking, but cut rates. Um, now, why does the market think this? Well, if you go a little bit further out along the curve, you notice that longer tenors, um, like the 10 year, like the 30 year, uh, they are also falling pretty considerably. Now the 10 year specifically, uh, it can be taken as sort of this uh, proxy for growth and inflation expectations. And in a uh, credit-based monetary system, um, inflation and growth are very much interlinked, unfortunately. Um, you know, credit expansion is necessary in order for growth um, in the real economy to occur on a positive real basis. Uh, and so the 10-year yield is sort of your proxy for growth and inflation expectations. Now, the 10-year yield has also fallen rather drastically. It's currently um, right around 325, which is very, very, uh, very, very crazy price action. Um, it, 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 like the two-year yield, started rising um, in uh, in 2020, actually, before the two-year yield. But um, it reached almost as high as 4.5%, and now it's moved down to, uh, like I said, 325, the 325 area. And this is actually the lowest it's been in uh, seven months, right? So since last September. And really, you know, there there isn't any sort of uh, support below this level or resistance rather, because we're talking about price and prices inverse to yield, right? And so there really isn't any uh, any resistance for this level. Should it break, um, it's really look out down below for the yield. And uh, this is really indicative of the broader growth slowdown that's occurring, right? Credit is contracting with banks. We've seen bank failures left and right, but even on a less severe basis, you're seeing less uh, loan syndication um, uh, from the, from banks, right? So banks are actually packaging and selling less loans uh, in the form of securities to the public. What does that mean, right? They're extending less loans. And so therefore, um, they're, they're selling less loans to the public, right? Public appetite for uh, actually funding these loans is going down. And so there's this credit crunch um, where credit growth is broadly slowing. And like I alluded to, in a credit-based monetary system, Credit expansion is growth. And so when credit uh, dries up and new credit stops being extended, 
growth falls through the floor. And that's what the bond market is saying with the 10 year yield falling through these targets. That's what the front end of the curve is saying with expecting policy cuts. And that's really what you see broadly uh, in the demand for commodities. And I'm sure we'll talk about what, what happened with OPEC. I know that you can add some color there because you certainly have more expertise than I. But there have been a slew of OPEC cuts, uh, production cuts over the last uh, year. Um, and they've been falling below uh, all of their production targets anyways. And so many people see this OPEC cut as inflationary. But in actuality, right, with the crude price uh, falling over the last year and then some, and the fact that over the last uh, three, four, five years, right, the, the, the sort of median price, you could call it, has been 40, 50 bucks, and we're still trading at $80 a barrel, despite um, the, this most recent line of cuts, it shows you that this is just a demand response function, right? It seems to me like global demand for crude is falling, um, and that's why these cuts came. So rather than being inflationary, they're a demand response. And so everywhere you look, um, this credit contraction um, is occurring, right? And of course, with that will come this growth slowdown, and you're already beginning to see it in some of these leading indicators like commodity prices. So that's basically what the bond market is signaling and what I'm witnessing in uh, markets more broadly. But I'd love to get into it. What about the magnitude of the moves in these uh, across the different parts of the yield curve and you know historically we were in an environment where rates had been low yes they had ticked up there for a while kind of pre-covid but just give people a sense of like the magnitude of these moves how quick they're changing um just the shape of the curve all the stuff the way that it's happening uh just in terms of the basically the magnitude is the word i'm looking for uh versus historically how these things move 100%. Yeah. So the amplitude of these daily changes, right? The up, down, up, down, the daily fluctuations, the amplitude of that, um, it's historic. We've never seen anything like it. We've never seen several weeks back to back. And I'm not, a I'm not, I tend to, I try not to be hyperbolic, but in this case, it's fully warranted. The adjectives I'm using are not hyperbolic. Um, th this amplitude by which uh, rates are moving up by 30 basis points on a day and then down 30 the following day and then up 15, then down 15, and then up 60 and down 60. You don't see that, right? The widest intraday moves you see in a normal market cycle um, on something like that's really actively traded like a two year or a 10 year uh, are, are probably you know 10 to 15 basis points on a very highly actively traded day. Those are the kind of moves that you see. But we are in a completely different regime now. These moves are more um, more volatile than Black Monday 1987. On Black Monday 1987, the two-year yield fell by something like 67 basis points. Um, three weeks ago, it fell by 81 basis points in a single day. And then throughout the week, it continued falling. And then it continued rising by equally large and very startling amounts. This is the type of bond volatility that explodes funds that aren't positioned for it. Um, this is the type of bond volatility that leads to an even more uh, immense credit contraction because people simply are not positioned to write loans using this kind of bond volatility. Um, and it's, uh, it, it, it's certainly, it's certainly odd. And, and essentially what we're witnessing happening right now is a curve on inversion and it's a very violent one. So basically we've talked about yield curve inversion. Uh, it's, you know, it's been the talk of the town on financial Twitter and elsewhere, uh, around macro talking circles. And basically the idea of curve inversion is along the yield curve, you should be compensated for excuse me, investing your money in longer dated instruments, right? Um, if you're investing your money in a three month bill, you should be invest you should be compensated uh, lower than if you were investing your money for a 30 year bond, right? Um, it, it only makes sense, right? But when the yield curve inverts, the inverse is actually true, right? So you're actually getting paid less to hold your money on longer tenors, and you're getting paid more to hold your money on shorter tenors. And just from a purely mathematical standpoint, that's just basically the market saying we expect rates to be lower in the near future. Um, and basically the reason that um, this uh, th this occurs um, is because there's some sort of policy error coming from the prevailing monetary authority. Remember, it tries to influence interest rates. And more often than not, it's very late to the party. And if it's trying to influence front end interest rates well after the damage has already been done in terms of inflation, um, uh, or in terms of sort of uh, something else occurring in the economy, then you witness this yield curve inversion, right? It's basically um, investors piling into the long end over the front end, um, and, and that's really not supposed to happen. And every single time we witness an uninversion, right? So a return to normal 
of the, those conditions. Basically, what's occurring here um, is the front end of the curve, right? We'll call it, you know, twos and below is getting bit up more than the long end, right? So the shape um, is downward sloping when the curve is inverted. Um, if you're plotting all of the tenors out along the x axis. And now when the curve is uninverting, it's returning to a normal, positively upward sloping uh, uh, shape. And the reason that's occurring is because people are piling into the front end more and more. Why are people piling into the front end more than the long end? Well, very, very simply, they expect rate cuts in the near future. And they feel that if uh, the, these front end rates won't be allowed for, around for much longer, right? They want to lock in uh, a four and a half percent uh, uh, two year treasury note. They want to lock in a four percent two year treasury note and now a three and a half percent treasury note. The, pre the yield keeps going down because investors believe that if they don't buy it now, they won't have a chance to in the near future, right? And so essentially they are expecting rate cuts by piling into the front end more than the long end. And that's what's causing this uninversion. And each time this has occurred, right? Why are investors doing this? Why did they expect front end rates won't be able to be, won't be as high as they are in the near future? It's because they expect rate cuts. And so the both the long end and the front end falling signal to us that not only are growth expectations falling, but because the front end is falling faster than the long end, it tells us that not only are growth expectations falling, but there will be cuts in order to uh, re-stimulate growth on the other end. So that's basically what the yield curve is telling us right now. Yeah, that's good. What about the uh, asset price responses over the last year, going back to when we started Fed hiking rates, the different types of asset classes? Um, you can talk about equities, obviously bonds, but just how things responded and uh, where are we at today in terms of some of these different asset markets? 100%. So we we like to run at CBL, we like to run a correlation, uh, a 40 day co rolling correlation between the S&P 500 and the 10 year US Treasury yield. And historically, um, as let's say as the 10 year rises, the S&P 500 also rises as the 10 year falls, the S&P 500 also falls, right? It's sort of, you know, basically the regime that occurs. And that's just the inverse bond and stock correlation, right? Um, as the price of bond goes down and its rate goes up, then the the, the equity prices also go up. That's the regime that we've been in for um, you know many many decades now, right? That's why the sixty forty portfolio works, and that's why it's a thing. Um, but <clears throat> beginning in twenty twenty two, we started seeing this huge inverse uh, S and P five hundred uh, correlation with uh, with rates as uh, bond prices sold off, right? And, and as I just said uh, over the last uh, several minutes here, yields broke through the stratosphere, right? They rose more aggressively than we'd, we've seen in several cycles, um, equities sold off, right? So rather than uh, rates and equities having a positive correlation, they, they now have a negative correlation. Um, however, that's begun to reverse. So now the stock and equity inverse correlation is back to some degree, right? So um, as these rates are falling, equities are also falling um, or equities are experiencing more macro weakness than they once were. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to derive signal from exactly what this means, but essentially throughout 2022, it was a year of firsts, right? It was not only the worst year for, um, the U S treasury market in many, many decades. I believe it was like the third worst year in the entire last century. Uh, but also it was the worst year for the 60, 40 portfolio ever in terms of uh, percentage losses, because this inverse bond equity correlation broke down. And now uh, this this bond equity inverse correlation is back, right? So uh, bonds are getting bid up pretty extensively um, from safe haven flows, right? Where do people go when they think that the economy is going to slow down? They go uh, to the to the investments and the instruments where they know that they can park their capital like risk free. Obviously, we know there are risks associated with owning treasuries, but relative to every other investment in the universe that large liquid players are willing to allocate to, treasuries are the risk free asset class. That's where people allocate to in times of recession, right? And when they're anticipating a massive contraction in the economy, these safe haven flows come into treasuries and they've come in in force in the last month. What also happens is there is a sale of riskier assets. Now we're in a, an interesting sort of transient period, um, synonym for transitive, uh, uh, transitory rather. I didn't want to say transitory because that word has been butchered by Jerome Powell and Janet Yellen, but this transient period where um, risk assets do really well because the Fed is expected to stop hiking interest rates, it's called the Fed pause rally. Uh, every single time that the Fed has paused hiking, risk assets do well. Uh, and so that's the period they're in right now. But this correlation is reemerging where safe haven flows are coming into treasuries. <clears throat> and on net, over a longer time frame, risk assets are doing poorly. What does that tell us? 
That tells us um, that there is a recession coming. There is a big slowdown coming and investors are de-risking. They're selling their, uh, their uh, riskier assets, the S&P 500, Bitcoin, on a longer term time frame, and they are bidding the hell out of U.S. Treasuries. And this overweight uh, accumulation of U.S. Treasuries ra uh, relative to this somewhat under uh, underweight accumulation of risk assets because of this risk asset rally, um, it shows us uh, via this 40-day rolling correlation that the bond equity inverse correlation is back in force and investors are positioning for a slowdown. So that's um, sort of the asset response that we're witnessing in 2022, it all broke down. Correlations shot to uh, correlations uh, completely broke down. Uh, both bonds and equities, and, and obviously other risk assets, sold off. But now that correlation is coming back, as uh, sort of investors get their wits about them and they position as they have every single cycle for a big slowdown by allocating to treasuries and de-risking. Yeah, my buddy uh, Michael Guy. I don't know if you follow the lead lag report. He has some funds that try to play off the traditional correlations and. Uh, protect, you know, protect investments based off of how those have historically played out. He's been kind of agonizing this last year around his funds performance, given just the fact that none of that stuff seemed to make sense in terms of what it would have done historically. And so it's interesting to see some of those trends coming back. You know, last year, it felt like uh, basically if you were in anything risk on, or if you were in bonds, you were getting absolutely slaughtered. Energy was kind of the the bright spot there. We had the pretty historic run up with the energy crisis in Europe or the would be crisis. They kind of got bailed out, um, with the, uh, with the mild winter, but natural gas prices had gone way up. Oil had gone way up. Um, now we've seen, uh, commodity prices really taking it on the chin, particularly natural gas is down to just a inflation adjusted level that is incredibly low. Uh, and in the futures market, as well as in the spot markets, it's just brutal. I think like the uh, the first of the month pricing for April was really, really bad, like under $2 for Nat gas. So we're seeing that and we're seeing it in lumber. We're seeing it across a bunch of different commodities. And so I think that um, last year was a weird year. This year, things seem to be set up or positioned for a looming recession. But it's also one of those recessions that everybody kind of feels like they know that it's coming. Uh, whereas some of these other ones we've had in the past, it was more people were caught off guard. It seems like today it is pretty much common knowledge that the market's positioning itself for a slowdown. So I think that brings us like to today and what you're seeing. You touched on it briefly, but just you've had some tweets over the last, call it 24, 48 hours. Um, what are you seeing just in real time uh, that the bond markets are doing? And then let's talk about growth. Let's talk about credit contraction and just some of the things that are kind of looming on the horizon and what the data is telling us. Yeah, 100%. So you know, you're you're right in the money when we're when we're talking about commodity prices, right? The they they've always been a great proxy for where the economy is headed, if it's moving into expansion or if it's moving into contraction. And um, really, what we're seeing in uh, in the truest sense here, in the way that the market is positioning, is for this this big old contraction. Um, Fed funds futures are great. Um, they've been a great tool of mine over the last uh, you know six to nine months, and they are generally wrong. Um, for a period of time, right? When we're talking like we're still a month out from the meeting, they can still be very volatile. Um, but when we are within striking distance of the meeting, let's call it, you know, um, three three weeks, as, as those final weeks trudge along, it basically ossifies right around what the Fed's going to do. And the, the market is becoming increasingly sensitive to new economic data that it didn't care about earlier in the cycle. And that tells me that markets are becoming more fragile. They're turning more on a dime. And uh, even the least tradable events historically are now becoming very tradable because of how fickle they are. And so markets, despite this being, and I, I don't know if this is an expression that's used every recession, but you, you alluded to it. This is a recession that everyone expects. Right. Um, despite that being the case, uh, markets are still really turning on a dime to reports that they didn't usually don't usually care about. And the, the report that I'm referencing is the jolts data. Um, this is job openings. Generally speaking, this is like one of the lowest signal uh, lowest signal economic data releases that you can expect uh, on the Bloomberg terminal. They have uh, little uh, like cellular bars, right? When you have good cellular connection, it's you know four bars. When you have bad, it's one bar. Um, and the Bloomberg terminal uses that to sort of denote the importance of different economic data. And Jolts has zero bars. It has no bars. And so nobody references this at all. But yesterday, the only report that came out, um, the only uh, s substantial report that was released yesterday was this Jolts job opening data. 
And in response to this JOLTS data, well, I'll, I'll tell you what the data was first. Um, job openings declined rapidly. Uh, the most rapid decline in job openings apart from COVID in the last century, at least as long as it's been measured. And so hmm. that's pretty massive. That's huge. And that shows that uh, labor demand is drying up pretty substantially, right? And very, very quickly. Um, obviously, off of COVID and massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, uh, companies hired up the wazoo uh, because they just could, right? They they allocated human and physical capital because it was just cheap to do so. And they were, they were leveraging that. Now that we are heading into a period where you sort of have to pay the piper, right? Money isn't free anymore. Every single floating rate in the world is now at least four and a half percent. You got to really pay up. Now all this uh, poorly allocated capital that was uh, brought on, whether it's physical or human, um, is being slashed. It's being slashed from these companies. And so new job openings, right, are falling pretty precipitously. Now, normally this wouldn't matter, right? Uh, you know, we have, we have, uh, we have you know, data releases where uh, job openings rise and data, the data weeks where job openings fall. Usually it's not the most tradable event, but for whatever reason, and I'm saying that, you know, the market is really turning on a dime. The market is scared. It's not expecting the severity of this downturn is because this was like a hugely tradable event yesterday, and it usually is not. Um, the rates market off of this data, it repriced down uh, on the front end by as much as 15 basis points, right? Um, twos, tens began uninverting um, to a very large degree. Twos Fed funds began inverting even more, right? Uninversion signals cuts. Inversion of twos Fed funds signals a pause. And so the market began hunkering down after this data point. That doesn't normally happen. And it tells me in confluence with all these other things that even though this is probably the most anticipated recession of my lifetime, <laughs> I've only lived through uh, two um, or three, I suppose, um, the market is still not ready necessarily for the severity of it. It was very, very shocked by uh, that job opening, uh, the, 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 the rapid, rapid decline in job openings. And as labor demand goes, eventually uh, you you will begin to see unemployment tick up rather materially. Unfortunately, unemployment comes out quarterly. But the, the beautiful thing about um, uh, data is that there are other sort of leading indicators that we can use for when the labor market is going on. Why my favorite one is initial jobless claims. Um, and that comes out tomorrow. And I'm very excited about that to see with this, the, the largest decline, as I said, barring COVID in uh, labor demand, um, what initial jobless claims look like. Uh, will we see a, a rapid pass through of this into initial jobless claims, which will tell us that unemployment will be materially higher uh, soon uh, at the next print, um, potentially. And I think that initial jobless claims tomorrow will sort of signal a lot of what is going to occur within uh, the labor market and within the downturn more broadly. What we're seeing now um, with this credit contraction, we're entering the you know, the downturn phase of the credit cycle where uh, banks stop extending new credit to customers, um, be it consumers, be it businesses, be it property developers. And then as a result of that, um, those businesses, they have to uh, they have to obviously wind down their operations to some degree. They have to sell some of their existing property, let's say. Um, they have to, you know, uh, uh, cut back on some of their own expenses. And so that is where the um, the credit cycle leads into sort of the economic cycle, right? The economic cycle is expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. Same deal with the credit cycle. And what the Fed has been trying to induce, this is exactly what the Fed has been trying to induce rather over the last year and a month since it started raising rates. And then in June when it started doing QT. When you are a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in the Fed's case, all it has are interest rate monetary policy and the ability to buy assets directly from banks. That's it. It has its interest rates and it has balance sheet. And right now, um, its rates are no longer working. It really front loaded its hiking cycle because it knew the moment that this credit contraction started occurring and this flight to safety started occurring in treasuries, it wouldn't be able to transmit policy effectively anymore. And now we're seeing the outcome of that. The Fed has been trying to induce a slowdown in credit expand or uh, in new credit because that's the only way it can control inflation. All it has are these interest rates. And so we are starting to see that now. The Fed tightened aggressively out of necessity. And now the downturn that comes on the other end of it will be just as severe and just as aggressive. And we are just seeing the beginning parts of that now, right? Bank failures um, wasn't necessarily expected. But with those bank failures, obviously, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the process of banks extending less credit to consumers, uh, businesses, and property developers, that is accelerating. And then obviously, you will be able to see that uh, in home prices, 
You'll be able to see that in uh, in the labor market, um, and you'll be able to see that in business activity, and business sentiment, um, and that's being <laughs> all. All of these things are sort of occurring all at once to some degree. Uh, when I'm talking about business sentiment, um, the purchasing managers index, uh, these these surveys that go out to uh, business managers within manufacturing and within the services industry. All of them are declining and declining rapidly, right? So business owners are basically surveying conditions are worse in X this month than they were last month. And so we are just at the beginning of this credit contraction and going into this growth slowdown. But all of these forward looking indicators, right? These these job openings, these surveys from from business managers tell us that, you know, we're in the eye of the storm for now. Things are OK. But the moment we, we, we exit, uh, things are going to get ugly once again. What about the layoffs that we've seen? I know we've seen the uh, we've seen it come through on the tech side. That was pretty obvious last year when the rates started going up. Tech companies that had been at these ridiculous valuations they fell off a cliff. Many of them, although some of them bounced back, but we saw a lot of layoffs there, and that was made a lot of headlines. But where have we been seeing them cropping up? I've seen a few tweets that you've done around some other industries that are flashing some warning signs for the labor market. Yes, so. I'll talk about one of the funnier ones that I saw, and then I'll talk about the more serious slash concerning ones. Well, I get—I suppose the first one is funny, but also seriously and a little bit concerning. Um, I, you definitely saw this headline flash across uh, Twitter. It was Google will be cutting back on tape and staplers in order to yeah. cut costs. Also, uh, in the, uh, the majority of their workforce, right, that aren't developers will now be using Chromebooks instead of their normal laptops, right? So they're cutting back on laptop purchases, um, they're cutting back on tape and staplers, and anybody that wants to expense a device over one thousand dollars has to get it approved first. Which that last one makes sense. But this big tech giant not only has have has tech um, been laying off employees over the last several years and downsizing their op not years rather months and downsizing their operations, but now they are cutting expenses in a very you know perceived like menial unimportant way. But it right. is very important, right? These these really interest rate sensitive players they got hit and they got hit the earliest. And um, the way you see this uh, this economic downturn unfold is first, the really interest rate sensitive entities get hit first, right? Whether that is a company, whether that is an asset. Uh, the assets that were very interest rate sensitive, the first ones to go were the Ponzi schemes. All the Ponzi schemes last year, Terra Luna exploded within one month of the Fed's first rate hike. So that was the most interest rate sensitive of them all, a literal Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Throughout the year, in descending order of how how uh, Ponzi-ish these things were, they also fell, whether they were a business or an asset. Now we're seeing the same thing <clears throat> over the last three to four months with these larger tech firms. Just as interest rate sensitive, definitely not Ponzi's, but just as interest rate sensitive, right? They, they rely on financing debt very cheaply in order to have their operations expand and continue and, and have run, business run as usual. But you can't, you know, you have to roll your debt at an increasingly higher uh, rate. It becomes a lot harder to do that. And because these tech firms are more reliant on, on, on debt financing and cheap debt financing, they're very interest rate sensitive. And so they've been firing people and now Google is doing this. Um, and, and so the more interest rate sensitive players go first, but the more concerning thing to me is when recession proof businesses or re recession resistant businesses begin firing employees, uh, whether it's actually on the floor or in their offices themselves. And, um, what we are witnessing right now is just that. So, um, Walmart has already laid off thousands of employees this year. And of course, Walmart is the largest private employer in the United States, but, uh, it's very concerning when, um, this recession resistant business where do people go right during a recession when they're downscaling their spending right the the largest department store chain in america they go begin buying their groceries there instead of uh the actual grocery store right they're trying to cut back on costs they go to these lower cost retailers like walmart and it's the largest private employer in america as i said but it shows you the severity of this economic downturn when even a recession proof business that sees this huge influx of customers during recessions is firing people, right? That's very concerning. And the the other thing that's extremely concerning, right? And this sort of falls under the it falls into the vein of cost cutting. Um, McDonald's is the third largest private employer in America. It makes me shudder when I say that, uh, but unfortunately, it is. It's the truth. Americans love their greasy seed oil ridden food. Um, I'm actually re wearing the Seed Oil Rebellion uh, shirt right now from uh, shout out <laughs> Seed Oil Disrespected. But anyway, uh, McDonald's, the third largest private employer in America, is also um, 
laying off uh, uh, some of its corporate employees on mass, right? Uh, it's predicted to lay off anywhere between 20 and 30% of its corporate workforce. That's no good, right? And obviously those corporate cuts um, are a measure to actually not have to to fire floor employees, but I, I don't doubt that that could be what's coming next. And so these recession resistant businesses, these businesses that see a higher influx of customers during a recession, and at the end of the day, you're always going to need your groceries. You're always going to uh, unfortunately, go to McDonald's for, for that cheap food. Um, the one in third largest private employers in America begin laying people off. That's when the recession alarm bells uh, really start kicking into high gear. Uh, and for me, that's the more concerning aspect of all of this, right? The Fed, with its aggressive, aggressive, aggressive hiking, it takes 12 to 18 months for that to actually pass through into the real economy, right? It influences front end rates um, and by influencing front end rates, it brings them up to a degree, but then eventually they stall. Um, but on net, it stops expanding its balance sheet and then liquidity falls and, and, and yada, 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 down the chain of dominoes, right? It impacts banks first, then it impacts businesses, then it impacts consumers. And we saw within three weeks, the banking sector went from completely fine and functioning normally, f functioning normally fully liquid to needing to use the Fed's emergency liquidity facilities on a regular basis, the Fed actively intervening by creating new emergency liquidity facilities, and every government speaker that was involved in finance to some degree going out of their pulpit and saying the banking sector is fine. That is how fragile uh, the, the economy has become, the financial system has become after 14 years almost of zero interest rates. Uh, and that's how, in response to the Fed's aggressive hiking, the downturn phase is going to be just as just as sudden, right? As we saw in the banking sector, it's going to be just as sudden when all of a sudden commercial real estate loans begin defaulting on mass. It's going to be just as sudden when all of a sudden initial jobless claims shoot through the stratosphere, right? And so that's really what this cycle is. It may be the most expected recession in history, but given the severity that I'm witnessing, right, with these layoffs and recession-proof businesses and, uh, you know, the fact that markets are trading these less than tradable events on a dime, it tells me that when the contraction comes for businesses, when it comes for property and when it comes for consumers, it's going to be just as sudden and even though it's really expected, just as, uh, just as impactful. Yeah, it's crazy to see the companies like Walmart, McDonald's. <clears throat> I don't go to McDonald's a lot, but when I've gone recently – they, I noticed that like prices were so much higher. I mean, you know, you buying like a basic meal, I think it was like pushing $10 uh, for like a, you know, a regular meal. My kids like McDonald's and there's one relatively close to our house. So sometimes they want happy meals. I'll go over there and pick one up. But if I look at like the pricing there, it's a little bit shocking to me, given where it's been historically. Also places like Subway, some of these kind of like discount, uh, discount fast food places. I mean, I think Subway, like, the sandwiches now, I don't know how they're doing it anymore. A lot of things have changed. I don't eat there a lot, but like the, for the largest sandwich, it's like $15 now. And I'm like, wait a second. When I was a kid, it was $5 foot long. After soccer practice, it was $5 foot long. And that was what was advertised. And you went after soccer and you got a $5 foot long. And now, you know, I, I remember back to uh, the last time I ate at Subway was, you know, getting ready for a varsity game. We were waiting for the bus and uh, I went to order a foot long. It was like 11 bucks. You yeah. know, five dollars right. to eleven, and these prices are crazy. And also, I went to McDonald's yesterday. Um, full disclosure, and I got a an ice cream cone, three bucks, three dollars and twenty something cents for an ice cream cone. It's getting pretty wild. So if it's slowing down, it means that people are more price sensitive. Uh, food in general is the costs have gone way up, but it seems like people now maybe are trying to figure out like what's the most budget friendly option. Which you would think Walmart would be there, but they're also slowing down. So it seems like the consumers are, you know, not spending as much on some of these items that they would have normally just gone out and spent on. But that, get, that gets to the pricing discussion. There's a chart I posted yesterday. I can't remember the guy that does these. He does all these data visualizations. He's always going viral on Reddit. Um, I forget his name, but basically he will put data visualizations around things like inflation. I think since I graduated college, which was in 08, 09, at the, right at the height of the Recession, uh, the average CPI is up about 42%, which is pretty shocking. Just in my kind of professional career, uh, the value of the dollar, uh, you know, in an aggregate basket of goods has lost 42% of his purchase pe purchasing power on things like healthcare. It's been uh, basically 100%. When I first started as a, uh, as a self-employed uh, company back in 2014, I had to go out and get healthcare. And I think I paid like 600 bucks or 700 bucks a month for myself, my wife, and my child. 
And now that has uh, more than doubled of what, when I have more kids, but if you normalized it, uh, it's more than doubled. Um, things like housing has gone way up. Uh, things like education has gone way up. And so it's pretty crazy to see these price spikes the last year and a half, two years since COVID and all the liquidity injections, prices have gone crazy. But what are we seeing now on, I know CPI is a number that can be messed with in a lot of different ways, but why don't you talk about uh, what that basket of goods looks like in terms of the allocations, if you know them, and then what are we seeing in terms of pricing, uh, where that's tracking, and uh, and what's that's, what that's saying about the future of inflation. Yes. So one thing I'll say right off the bat is I'll read off a, uh, a quote from the Bank of England. Now, we obviously know that the when it, when it comes to the United States, we are the beneficiary of the most liquid, uh, you know, sort of the most liquid and actively used currency around the world. So when we debase, uh, it impacts us less than it does our, our counterparts globally, who actually have to debase more on a relative basis in order to uh, make sure that their currency uh, doesn't strengthen too much relative to the dollar. When we weaken our currency, everyone else has to as well, uh, to a much larger degree. And that has led to much higher in price inflation, uh, of course, over there across the pond. Uh, in the Bank of England, they're fighting 10.4% inflation, and it's still up there where we've been able to reel it back in. We're now at 6% inflation, still absurd. Uh, it's still very undercalculated. Um, uh, the UK is battling 10.4% inflation. Uh, in the Bank of England, uh, one of their speakers, um, Tenreiro, I do not know their first name, uh, Sil Silvana Tenreiro, they said that they see rates falling to keep inflation on track. Wait a minute. What was that, Silvana? Can you repeat that? Yes, she said. <laughs> we see rates falling to keep inflation on track. That's interesting. She said that she sees an earlier and faster reversal of recent hikes to keep inflation from falling well below target. Wait a minute. The veil just came off, right? This idea of inflation targeting from central banks. This is what central banks do. They, they create a problem and then they work to destroy the problem. And in doing so, uh, they create mass, uh, you know, this, this mass uh, tumult and this mass turmoil for, you know, real people, this mass misery. Um, you know, they create the inflation problem, which is an unfortunate byproduct of the system that we live under, right? That, that is incumbent on credit growth and credit creation for real economic growth. They create the problem by keeping rates locked at zero, expanding their balance sheet and really incentivizing this credit creation. Then when it gets out of control, they do the exact opposite. They aggressively restrict access to new credit. They aggressively remove money in the ways that they can from the real economy. Then that creates mass unemployment, and then they come back and, and they do the inverse all over again. And so, really, they are they are creating problems and then solving them. And the the veil really came off, right? They're contending with ten point four percent inflation, but the UK tightened so fast that now it's worried about deflation and is considering rate cuts to prevent that. So I mentioned amplitude. The amplitude of these moves in interest rates when we're talking about U.S. Treasuries is staggering. It's never happened before. Um, you know, intraday Treasuries don't just swing half a percentage point regularly for several weeks in a row. That just doesn't happen. Now, the, the same thing is true of every other component of the economic cycle. These cycles are growing wider and more pronounced in their amplitude, in their wild swings upward in uh, expansion, and their wild swings downward in contraction. And central banks have no idea what to do. Inflation is 10.4%, and they are talking about making sure they cut rates so that it doesn't fall below their 2% inflation target. That's insanity, right? When it comes to um, the CPI basket here in the United States, though, um, a couple leading indicators we can use to sort of gauge what that's going to do. We talked about commodity prices; those are useful, right? Um, or you know, crude oil. The the price for crude can sort of be thought of, and you know this uh, as a derivative for the price of other things, um, the price of food, uh, the price of other goods and services. Um, because uh, broadly, not only is it an input to a lot of those things, as is the case with copper. Um, but also it is uh, sort of a proxy for demand, right? If this demand for the most widely used energy globally uh, is falling in the form of its price falling and even these supply uh, uh, constraints, but its price is still staying stagnant, that shows you demand is being destroyed. And so for, uh, that, that's one leading indicator we can use here in the U.S. to say that inflation probably won't be you know, sticky per se, as many pundits have, have said. I tend to disagree with that because of the, 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 the oil thing. But also, if you take a look at prices paid, um, which is a component of both the ISM manufacturing survey and the ISM services survey, um, on both fronts that is contracting, and it's contracting very quickly. Excuse me. In this most recent survey, it fell from 
And this is an oscillator. It oscillates around the 50 level. Above 50 is expansion. Below 50 is contraction. Basically, that's just whether uh, you know more or less survey respondents said that conditions, uh, prices are more expensive or less expensive than last month. And so that metric fell from uh, 65.6 to 59.5, right? So it's a pretty steep fall. Um, but also, if you take a look at what leads prices paid is new orders. And new orders fell from 62.6 to 52.2. And so people are getting much, much, much less orders. Um, not only are they making much, much, uh, far fewer orders in their businesses, but they are receiving far fewer orders. And what naturally comes after that, it's lower and lower and lower prices to try to stimulate demand from these businesses. And so uh, asset prices are falling right on the manufacturing front um, and also on the services front, um, prices are falling as well. And so I have no doubt that the CPI basket will soon follow and will continue to see disinflation. The question is, how quickly will that disinflation come? I think uh, there's more of a, you know, um, th there's more of a, a a right tail risk chance that we get faster disinflation than a left tail risk chance of disinflation being sticky. I feel, and and that's just a, a byproduct sort of downstream of everything that I've talked about in this discussion today, which is that this cycle is contracting much faster than previous cycles have. It's breaking all precedents from a volatility standpoint, not just on the inflation front, but also on the behavior of the bond market in response to what the, the prevailing monetary authority is doing. And so I tend to think that because of how fragile, how fickle this cycle is contracting and, and deterioration is occurring so swiftly, I tend to think that the same will be the case for price inflation. And um, the, the Fed may have to make the choice to, uh, to pause here and potentially cut sooner than it would like to. Cuts are not my base case for, for at least a very long while, right? It, it has the chance, it has the ability to maintain financial stability through these uh, facilities that it props up as well as its balance sheet tools while keeping rates elevated to try and contract credit. But the question is, is that credit contraction so severe that CPI uh, reaches its 2% target much sooner than anticipated? Um, and it really threatens deflation, which is terrible for, for economic growth. So that's the question I think that will begin coming to people's minds like six months from now. I think the question for the next uh, you know, three to nine months, it's, it's basically right at our doorstep, is how severe will this contraction be? Um, and I, I tend to think you know, more and more each day as, as these really startling uh, data points come out, I, I tend to think it will be more severe than most expect. It's really interesting. I don't have a Bloomberg and I, I'm not a big chart guy, but I one time not too long ago, I went to go look back at like the history of CPI around the times when we've had these big inflation shocks. And if you look at kind of if you look at all the periods we've had these kind of excluding the 70s and 80s, uh, there was a longer period of just elevated inflation there where it kind of oscillated up and down. But in some of these major shocks, we've seen it go to deflation pretty quickly thereafter within two years, I think like 2008, uh, COVID, I think we got into deflation. Um, you look back at like in the World War II and some of these other, you know, kind of big events where we've had uh, inflation spike really hard and then it comes basically falling off a cliff uh, relatively rapidly. I would love to see that chart or for you to look at that and see. I think when I looked at it, I, I came up with like 12 events where inflation had spiked in roughly 50% of the time or maybe a little like 45% of the time. It, it fell pretty much off a cliff right afterwards um, and, and sometimes into deflationary territory. So it, you know, it makes sense to me that um, we could be heading into a sharper contraction there. And I think, you know, at some level you've heard this narrative around, well, we've never seen, um, inflation be tamed unless the CPI drops below the fed funds rate. Um, it's not far from there right now, um, being at six something percent in the funds rate, I guess being around five or wherever it is currently. But, you know, there's some things that are lagging indicators. I mean, like I've seen a lot, I listen to a lot of real estate macro people, and talking about just how rents are coming down pretty sharply, but because of the lag in uh, the reporting for that, it's not really showing up. In fact, you're still, you know, that's kind of what's been propping it up. Um, mm -hmm. But that data is not good data. It's like driving, looking in the rear view, rear view mirror. That is correct. Yeah, the, the owner's equivalent rent, which is sort of the housing equivalent, is super stale and it's super lagging. Uh, the way that it's calculated is also questionable too. So the CPI, if anything, is a really bad proxy for what actual asset price inflation is. And obviously things, you know, the way it's weighted, I also very much disagree with, you know, CPI historically is a really bad proxy for actual price inflation, but, um, you're, you're right. That is one of the components that is really, really lagging, uh, for sure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the commercial real estate 
issues that you see on the horizon. You've put out a few pieces. Um, I got two more main topics. I know we're running into the hour here soon, but uh, I want to talk about that. And then I want to talk about the uh, the death of the dollar exaggerations that we see a lot. I think you guys also put out a good piece on that. But speaking on commercial real estate, to me, my broad take on it, and then I'll let you respond, is that you know if you look at like residential or some of these asset classes in real estate that don't that aren't um, priced based off of the NOI or the net operating income. So for example, if you're a office building and you have a certain amount of occupancy, or if you're a strip mall and you have a cer certain amount of occupancy or a storage unit, uh, these things that traditionally fall into the CRE or commercial real estate bucket, then you can calculate a cap rate based on what, you know, the net operating income that's coming in. And then you can look at say a proxy to where that asset's valued. And when they go through appraisals, uh, you know, for these loans to, to borrow against these assets, they're going to use uh, that income. And I think that there's a lot of problems with some of these assets now uh, that are showing falling income, showing certainly in the office space side, uh, a lot of vacancy given the work from home movement. But things like the residential side, I feel like it may be a little insulated just given the equity base that's built up. I mean, it's crazy. Like, you know, had you bought anything in the last couple of years, um, your cost basis is probably pretty low. In some instances, prices have gone up 50% or more on in the residential side. And many of these people have very low rates. And so they're not really at a default risk because their rate is locked in low. They've got just a huge amount of equity, even a 20% pullback. They still probably got have good equity depending on when they bought. Now, maybe if they bought it like at the very height, right before things start slowing down, they could be uh, in trouble if they needed to exit. But um, residential aside, uh, because of those factors, I think it's a little bit more insulated. I think borrowing standards are higher. But in terms of the stuff that's being priced off of net operating income and the cash flows coming in, and then also the nature of the duration of those loans or shorter duration, uh, a lot of them sometimes have a fixed, uh, excuse me, a floating rate uh, to that debt. But just talk about some of the cracks that you've seen and reported on uh, in the commercial real estate front. Yeah. So, you know, obviously many are faced uh, when it comes to commercial real estate, obviously elevated rates are a problem, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's, th this is sort of widely known. Um, and also a, a great majority of this, uh, the, the outstanding debt isn't variable rate, which is also nice for commercial real estate. And so it's not like in the, during the life of a loan, people will be, uh, people will be hit by these elevated rates. It's when, when is that maturity wall? Uh, for commercial real estate. And in the United States, um, there is a, if I have the chart in front of me, a $317 billion maturity wall, uh, uh, total commercial real estate debt maturing now through the end of 2024. $162 billion of that is uh, actually maturing this year. And um, one of the one of the scarier aspects is, okay, um, I'm taking a look at my terminal, I type in CRE Go, and I look at the actual, uh, you know, based on the, the um, based on the LTV, um, whether you're over collateralized or less over collateralized, what sort of rate can you get? And on uh, new, uh, new fixed fixed rate uh, mortgages for commercial real estate, um, depending on the creditworthiness of the borrower, obviously, uh, rates are uh, anywhere from uh, 1,000 basis points to uh, 1,800 basis points, right? So 10 to 18 percent. That's crazy especially for developers who may have their existing debt outstanding at a fraction or a fraction of that, right? Four, five, six, seven. And I'm not a commercial real estate developer, so I don't actually know what the average rate on commercial real estate debt is. But I do know um, that a lot of this was financed very cheaply. Um, there is this massive maturity well coming up. And the reason I know that this is going to be an issue for many people to, to actually uh, refinance this at higher rates and keep their properties is because of the $162 billion in total commercial real estate debt that sets mature this year, 35 billion of it is already past due, right? And so mm -hmm. if we, you know, do some quick math, we're a quarter of the way through the year, um, uh, or uh, a third of the way through the year here, rather, um, a quarter, I'm a moron, March just ended. Um, and, uh, you know, this 35 billion is almost a quarter of 162 billion. What does that tell you, right? Um, almost a quarter of the outstanding debt that's due to mature this year, um, and we're a quarter of the way through the year, is already past due. So that is very disconcerting, right? This debt is not being rolled into new debt. Rather, the 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 payments on that debt is is overdue. And and what happens after that? And that's just the, the broadly telling me that um, 
the 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 property developers don't have the stomach to roll their debt at these higher rates and they're going to be forced to default on their obligations have those assets reclaimed by banks and then have uh you know the 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 real estate sitting there and owned by the bank or or sold or attempt to be sold but you know they're going to be banks are going to have to sell this into a, a very inactive market um you know until there there's there's a price that can be found for a lot of this but one thing is for sure is that um, you know with this uh, with this maturity well here now um, there's going to be a a pretty precipitous reclaiming of this assets by banks and then obviously um, selling it and it's certainly not helped at all by the fact that um, banks are uh, are really they're failing not only are they doing that because of these bank runs um, from big and small banks. But the banks that are failing are the regional banks, and regional banks make up 70% of commercial real estate loans. And so obviously funding is tighter because of those elevated rates that I mentioned, but funding is also tighter now because those very banks are failing and they're losing depositors. So naturally they'll be able to create less loans. And so really it's a sort of tsunami of unfavorable conditions from the lending side of things, from the revenue side of things, vacancies are at an all-time high for US Metro Office Space. And, um, you know, the fact that this huge maturity well is here and already one quarter of the debt due this year hasn't been paid yet, uh, it's very disconcerting. And so, um, you know, I, I think a fire, uh, a fire sale of commercial real estate assets uh, is definitely in its future. For sure. But it'd be interesting to see if the people, when they go to sell them, who's going to originate the loans uh, for the buyers. You know, typically these are leveraged assets. It's hard to, you know, buy an office building with cash unless maybe you're, you know, a huge institution. And, uh, but I mean, for, you know, these banks, I have more experience on the, you know, seeing guys in the oil and gas space, you know, regional banks are pretty critical for oil and gas startups, particularly on the drilling side, uh, to have revolvers, have facilities in place where they can lend against their reserves. And what we've seen in some of these, you know, volatile oil and gas downturns is that the banks are very reluctant, uh, to, you know, let guys default. They also are very reluctant to take over the assets. Like a lot of times they just don't want to own and be an operator of an asset. So, you know, many times when we thought, okay, there's going to be this wave of insolvency or bankruptcies, um, it actually didn't materialize as bad as we thought, because a lot of times banks, you know, found out ways to work with those borrowers to help them extend uh, the runway, because what's their alternative? It's like, okay, like you can, you know, you default on this. Now I'm the owner. Now, you know, I don't want to own a bunch of commercial real estate. And in my experience has been now, I don't want to own and operate a bunch of oil and gas wells. And so they've figured ways to uh, kick the can, let them pay interest only, let them refinance, let them, you know, push out the maturity. Uh, Cause it's like, well, look, it's better for me to get some of the money from this or to let them continue to pay interest payments uh, rather than them defaulting. And now I'm not getting, you know, not getting what I thought I was going to be getting. That being said, they're also uh, in a position to, like you mentioned, where they're in distress because of deposits fleeing and because of these other headwinds that they're facing. So will they have the ability to do that? I don't know, but it definitely seems like a looming thing here in the near future that we need to keep an eye on. Um, okay, five minutes left. Uh, just the this thing right lately, it seems like everything on Twitter moves in packs. Um, you know, I did the thread last week or two weeks ago when you guys asked me to talk about the petrodollar and i was like yeah i'll do a thread on this just because i'm trying to research a little bit and the thread did really well and then it was crazy like i'm not saying it was because of my thread but it seems like people move in packs it was like 20 other threads like that week that were in some way not necessarily all about the petrodollar but a lot of them about the death of the dollar or you know the us dollar losing its reserve status and it just seemed like you couldn't get on Twitter without seeing something about this. Um, just your thoughts on it. I know you guys put out a good piece a while back, but um, maybe a more sober view of the dollar's role in the world economy. Yes, you're you hit the nail on the head. You know, sensationalism sells, especially on Twitter. People move in packs, um, and I would even go so far as to say, like people move in packs like hyenas. Um, it's never, it's no long, you know, it, to a large degree. These bigger accounts, it's not even about truth or like data-driven analysis. It's just about what's going to get the most clicks, what's the coolest headline I can make, and it you know totally grinds my gears. And um, you know, in the case of something like commercial real estate, where there actually are risks posed to this thing, uh, it warrants a little bit more you know sensational adjectives and language. But this idea of the death of the dollar, not even remotely true or backed by the data, um, you know, and uh, this. Um, this idea has been uh, floating. I know that uh, several bigger accounts, uh, Genevieve Rock, Dector, I believe was one of them who tweeted out that the dollar is losing its status as world reserve currency. 
And that just, uh, that was absolutely nuts and not supported by the data whatsoever. People tend to conflate the value of a currency with its status as a world reserve currency in FX reserves. And they're not the same thing. When people say the dollar is losing its status as world reserve currency, more often than not, they're just saying world reserve currency because they don't really know what it means, but they know that the dollar is losing its value because there is price inflation and the, the you know uh, uh, relative to asset prices, the dollar is falling. And so therefore the dollar is not going to be used to lubricate global trade anymore. Um, but that's not even remotely the case, right? Uh, the value of a currency has nothing to do with its prominence in FX reserves. And um, we, we, we wrote a piece exactly about this. The dollar is so entrenched in global financial markets. It's so entrenched in global trade that it, it's not something you can unplug and plug back in. And if you were going to do that, why on earth would you? All currencies are debasing just like the dollar, right? So the argument that, well, the dollar is debasing, so therefore it's, gonna, yeah. it's not going to be what lubricates global trade anymore. Well, guess what? So is every other fiat currency. Not only does the dollar do its job, but it's the most liquid currency in the world. And when you are a lubricating global trade, you're dealing with trillions in flows every single day, then that's what you want. You want a good medium of exchange. And what does that mean? That means a huge liquidity profile and nothing challenges the dollar's liquidity profile. It's doing its job exactly as it needs to. And when it comes to a world reserve currency, people will often point to, well, what about BRICS? What about this? What about that? What about this? Okay. Um, a group of nations, right? What are they going to do? Are they all going to uh, jointly uh, upend the dollar's hegemony? Are they jointly all going to stop using the dollar? That's awesome. You can stop using the dollar. But then what does that mean? You all have to fight amongst yourselves as to whose currency you're going to use. Obviously, Russia wants it to be theirs and China wants it to be theirs and India wants it to be theirs. And then when you do that, you have to deal exclusively in that. And who's to say everybody else on the world, everybody else on the planet is going to agree that they're going to accept your currency for trade. It just doesn't work, right? We got, we hit the jackpot, right? With Bretton Woods, the fact that now the dollar lubricates all global trade. We are the main world reserve currency. We, there are several world reserve currencies. People think there is only one. This is not the case, right? It's, it's a term that people love throwing around. It's Twitter's favorite buzzword as of now. Um, but we hit the jackpot because we plugged in this cartridge and now this massive intricate web of interconnected financial relationships has been built atop the dollar. And that's not something that can be unplugged, right? Barring the Armageddon of the United States and the United States Treasury and like the, the total uh, nuclear annihilation of the country, the United States of America, the dollar isn't going anywhere. On a relative basis, all fiat are debasing to actually judge the prominence of a world reserve currency as a world reserve currency. Look at reserves, look at FX mm -hmm. reserves of countries. And the thing that I will leave it on is that world currency composition of foreign exchange reserves, the dollar has only gone up. It's been sitting at roughly 55%. The dollar makes up 55% of all world uh, central bank foreign exchange reserves over the last 20 years. So it has not declined. And actually since 2014, it has been increasing, right? So in 2014, it fell to about 45% and it's been increasing, right? Over the last decade, it's risen from 45% to 55 to 60%. So if the dollar was losing its world reserve currency status, then why are more dollars being a component of FX reserves? I think this whole nonsense about the dollar losing its world reserve currency status are just people trying to get clicks, but they don't actually understand what makes a world reserve currency or what makes the dollar the prominent world reserve currency or how difficult and impractical there it would be to replace it in all of the world's financial plumbing or the fact that there literally is no impetus to do it. And uh, yeah. sorry to go on a bit of a rant there, but that's you know all my all my thoughts about this whole thing. The dollar isn't no. dying; it's it's only growing in use. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's a lot of good things, a lot of good points that you made there. All right, last thing, uh, you know, the Fed is trying to fight all these things. It's you know it's raised rates, but you know where we're sitting at now, we're at five percent, and gold is over two thousand dollars an ounce, and Bitcoin's at around twenty eight thousand uh, dollars. What do you think about? when this pause, you know, fully kicks in or when they have to start, you know, cutting rates, uh, that's not really where they want to see. That's not where I would think that they would want to see those two prices sitting at. Uh, and I guess you can talk about Bitcoin uh, from that perspective, just any thoughts on where we're at in the price and just how it all plays into everything we talked about on this, in this discussion. 
100%. Absolutely. Uh, again, Max, thanks for having me on, man. Uh, this was really fun. I always enjoy uh, sitting down and chatting with you. You're you're really, um, you know, you you have your finger on the pulse of markets just like I do. So it's always a good good chat. When it comes to asset prices, right, we're in this, and I'll say transient again, we're in this transient period where it's sort of like la-la land for risk, um, where yeah. we're in this increasingly fragile environment for financial markets. But by the same time, the Fed pause rally is here. Woo! And even though the Fed pause, right, rates are still at 5%. That's not an accommodative discount rate for companies. People are, they're not realizing that. And the the reason that risk assets trade the way they do during Fed pause rallies is because it's the rate of change, right? We're moving from interest rates rising to interest rates not rising. And that one state change, that change from a one to a zero makes risk assets go bananas. Um, when the reality finally sets in, when this credit crunch moves its way into the real economy, we start to see the labor market unwind, we start to see home prices fall and real economic uh, sort of devastation. Um, that is when cuts will come onto the table. And at that time, risk assets will sort of snap back to reality, right? Cuts are not bullish. Uh, in the long term, cuts are. Obviously, a lower discount rate is more supportive of equity valuations and you know better equity valuations. It drags up not just equities, but also risk asset prices with them. Uh, risk asset prices like Bitcoin uh, with them. But uh, you know the reason the Fed cuts is what is not bullish, right? The Fed cuts in response to economic deterioration, right? Financial market dysfunction, or uh, an unwind in the labor market. And we are in the beginning phase of all three of those things occurring. And so risk stands to do well for the next however many months that this Fed pause continues. But once you begin to see economic deterioration show up in the really hard data, the lacking data, um, you know, the, the unemployment rate and, and things like that, that is when you start to see risk assets, I believe, snap back to reality, come back down to earth. And, um, you know, until then, Party's on, right? Don't fight, uh, don't fight the bear market rally, rather, um, is what I will say. A uh, 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 Fed pause rally, rather. And, uh, you know, we, we stand to do pretty well in terms of risk asset pricing until those macro headwinds fully materialize and then the Fed cuts. Cuts, when they happen, are not bullish. Of course, in the, in the months and years uh, following them, they are bullish. Yeah, that's a good way to end it, Joe. Thanks again for coming on, man. I really, I really enjoy it. Impressed with your work. Uh, you're a young guy. You're, you know, doing a lot of great things. I would encourage anybody that made it this far, hopefully you enjoyed the conversation. Go follow Joe, check out the Bitcoin layer. Uh, you guys are doing good stuff, but thanks again, Joe. Thanks, Max. Have a good one.